When heaven is about to confer a great responsibility on any man, it will exercise his mind with suffering, subject his sinews and bones to hard work, expose his body to hunger, put him to poverty, place obstacles in the paths of his deeds so as to stimulate his mind, harden his nature, and improve wherever he is incompetent. What doesn't kill me makes me stronger. This chapter is about what we might call the adversity hypothesis, which says that people need adversity, setbacks, and perhaps even trauma to reach the highest levels of strength, fulfillment, and personal development. I don't want to. I don't want to have this chance, but it's here now. And what am I going to do about it? Am I going to rise to the occasion? For decades, research in health psychology focused on stress and its damaging effects. A major concern in this research literature has always been resilience, the ways people cope with adversity, fend off damage, and bounce back to normal functioning. Researchers have gone beyond resilience and begun to focus on the benefits of severe stress. Post-traumatic growth in direct contrast to post-traumatic stress disorder. Researchers have now studied people facing many kinds of adversity, including cancer, heart disease, HIV, rape, assault, paralysis, infertility, house fires, plane crashes, and earthquakes. How people cope with the loss of their strongest attachments, children, spouses or partners, and parents Rising to a challenge reveals your hidden abilities, and seeing these abilities changes your self-concept. None of us knows what we are really capable of enduring. You might say to yourself, I would die if I lost X, or I could never survive what Y is going through. If you did lose X or find yourself in the same position as Y, your heart would not stop beating. You would respond to the world as you found it, and most of those responses would be automatic. People sometimes say they are numb or on autopilot after a terrible loss or trauma. Consciousness is severely altered, yet somehow the body keeps moving. Over the next few weeks, some degree of normalcy returns as one struggles to make sense of the loss and of one's altered circumstances. What doesn't kill you makes you, by definition, a survivor, about whom people then say, I could never survive what Y is going through. One of the most common lessons people draw from bereavement or trauma is that they are much stronger than they realized. This new appreciation of their strength then gives them confidence to face future challenges. And they are not just confabulating a silver lining to wrap around a dark cloud. People who have suffered through battle, rape, concentration camps, or traumatic personal losses often seem to be inoculated against future stress. They recover more quickly, in part because they know they can cope. Suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. The person who has had more experience of hardships can stand more firmly in the face of problems than the person who has never experienced suffering. From this angle, then, some suffering can be a good lesson for life. 
trauma changes priorities and philosophies toward the present. The reality that people often wake up to is that life is a gift they have been taking for granted. I don't want to celebrate suffering, prescribe it for everyone, or minimize the moral imperative to reduce it where we can. I don't want to ignore the pain that ripples out from each diagnosis of cancer, spreading fear along lines of kinship and friendship. I want only to make the point that suffering is not always all bad for all people. There is usually some good mixed in with the bad, and those who find it have found something precious, a key to moral and spiritual development. Must we suffer? Adversity may be necessary for growth because it forces you to stop speeding along the road of life, allowing you to notice the paths that were branching off all along and to think about where you really want to end up. Human beings were shaped by evolutionary processes to pursue success, not happiness, People enthusiastically pursue goals that will help them win prestige in zero-sum competitions. Success in these competitions feels good, but gives no lasting pleasure, and it raises the bar for future success. When tragedy strikes, however, it knocks you off the treadmill and forces a decision. Hop back on and return to business as usual, or try something else? There is a window of time, just a few weeks or months after the tragedy, during which you are more open to something else. During this time, achievement goals often lose their allure, sometimes coming to seem pointless. Many people change their goals in the wake of adversity, they resolve to work less, to love and play more. If in those first few months you take action, you do something that changes your daily life, then the changes might stick. But if you do nothing more than make a resolution, I must never forget my new outlook on life, then you will soon slip back into old habits and pursue old goals. you need interesting material to write a good story. You can't have a good life story without vicissitudes. Several genres are associated with well-being. In the commitment story, the protagonist has a supportive family background, is sensitized early in life to the sufferings of others, is guided by a clear and compelling personal ideology, and at some point, transforms or redeems failures, mistakes, or crises into a positive outcome, a process that often involves setting new goals that commit the self to helping others. In contrast, some people's life stories show a contamination sequence in which emotionally positive events go bad and everything is spoiled. People who tell such stories are not surprisingly more likely to be depressed. Indeed, part of the pathology of depression is that while ruminating, the depressed person reworks her life narrative by using the tools of Beck's negative triad. I'm bad, the world is bad, and my future is dark. Although adversity that is not overcome can create a story of depressing bleakness, substantial adversity might be necessary for a meaningful story. Trauma often shatters belief systems and robs people of their sense of meaning. In so doing, it forces people to put the pieces back together, rebuilding beautifully those parts of their lives and life stories that they could never have torn down voluntarily. When people report having grown after coping with adversity, they could be trying to describe a new sense of inner coherence. This coherence might not be visible to one's friends, 
but it feels like growth, strength, maturity, and wisdom from the inside. When bad things happen to good people, we have a problem. We know consciously that life is unfair, but unconsciously we see the world through the lens of reciprocity. The downfall of an evil man in our biased and moralistic assessment is no puzzle. He had it coming to him. But when the victim was virtuous, we struggle to make sense of his tragedy. The desperate need to make sense of events can lead people to inaccurate conclusions. The ability to make sense of tragedy and then find benefit in it is the key that unlocks post-traumatic growth. Psychologists have devoted a great deal of effort to figuring out who benefits from trauma and who is crushed. The answer compounds the already great unfairness of life. Optimists are more likely to benefit than pessimists. People who have a basic level trait of optimism tend to develop a coping style that alternates between active coping and reappraisal. Because optimists expect their efforts to pay off, they go right to work fixing the problem. But if they fail, they expect that things usually work out for the best, and so they can't help but look for possible benefits. When they find them, they write a new chapter in their life story. A story of continual overcoming and growth. In contrast, people who have a relatively negative affective style live in a world filled with many more threats and have less confidence that they can deal with them. They develop a coping style that relies more heavily on avoidance and other defense mechanisms. They work harder to manage their pain than to fix their problems, so their problems often get worse. Drawing the lesson that the world is unjust and uncontrollable and that things often work out for the worst, they weave this lesson into their life story where it contaminates the narrative. If you are a pessimist, you are probably feeling gloomy right now. But despair not. The key to growth is not optimism per se, it is the sense-making that optimists find easy. If you can find a way to make sense of adversity and draw constructive lessons from it, you can benefit too. You have to use words. And the words have to help you create a meaningful story. If you can write such a story, you can reap the benefits of reappraisal. even years after an event. You can close a chapter of your life that was still open, still affecting your thoughts and preventing you from moving on with the larger narrative. Anyone, therefore, can benefit from adversity. The first step is to do what you can before adversity strikes to change your cognitive style. No matter how well or how poorly prepared you are when trouble strikes, at some point in the months afterwards, pull out a piece of paper and start writing. Don't edit or censor yourself. Don't worry about grammar or sentence structure. Just keep writing. Write about what happened, how you feel about it, and why you feel that way. If you hate to write, you can talk into a tape recorder. The crucial thing is to get your thoughts and feelings out without imposing any order on them, but in such a way that after a few days, some order is likely to emerge on its own. Before you conclude your last session, be sure you have done your best to answer these two questions. Why did this happen? What good might I derive from it? 
for everything, there is a season. The mind is its own place and in itself can make a heaven of hell a hell of heaven. When it comes to explaining personality, it's always true that nature and nurture work together. If the adversity hypothesis is true, then there should be times in life when adversity will be more or less beneficial things die. It is the way of life. All we can do is try to find a reason to go on, build it again.